Greetings and salutations, my fellow sovereigns. This is the Saturday Night Civics and Sovereignty class for the Vocational Science of Freedom. And we will be continuing our reading of The Great Taking. This will be the sixth installment. And the book I put into chat in the Gilded server. And if you'd like to join the Gilded server, you can do so at gilded.gg slash VSOF. And that link is on the Vocational Science of Freedom YouTube page right here. And it's also in all of the show notes for all of the classes on Odyssey and on Rumble and on YouTube. And we left off on chapter nine, the great deflation. Wisdom comes alone through suffering. I went down to the Cleveland Public Library and paged through the old chart books of commodity prices and stocks stretching back to the 19th century. I found that in the 1930s, all commodities, with the sole exception of gold, bottomed at the lows of the prior 60 years. Most public companies ceased to exist. They had gone bankrupt. The shareholders were wiped out. The assets were taken by the secured creditors, the banks selected by the Federal Reserve System. Price levels did not recover for decades. In 1923, Grandpa Rogers, the surgeon who had been in the first U.S. medical unit in the Great War, bought three housing lots in Slacker Heights, a new upscale suburb of Cleveland. These properties would have gone up in value through the 20s. In 1929, the stock market crashed. He was probably quite glad that he had not sold the lots and put the money into the stock market. In 1933, when the banks were closed, he was probably quite glad that he had not... Oh, sorry. Let's scroll down here. In 1952, three decades later, his widow finally sold the lots for one-third of what Grandpa Rogers had paid for them in 1923. This was not because Shaker Heights was economically depressed in 1952. Shaker Heights was, in the 1950s and into the early 1960s, statistically the wealthiest suburb in the United States. In 1905, my great-great-grandfather's coal yard was valued in a bank appraisal at $126,000. A modern industrial building with heavy overhead hoists was built on the property in the 1920s by my grandfather. That became the site of web equipment, the crane and hoist business. After my father's death in 1981, this property with equipment and materials was sold for less than 80000 This was after three quarters of a century. Further confirmation of the persistence of the deflation is found in this paper by Tom Nichols and Anna Sherbina, looks like, uh, titled Real Estate Prices During the Roaring Twenties in the Great Depression. Using unique data on real estate transactions, we construct nominal and CPI-adjusted hedonic price indices for Manhattan from 1920 to 1939. The CPI-adjusted index falls during the recession that followed World War I, rises to a local peak in 1926, and declines again following the collapse of the Florida real estate bubble. It subsequently recovers to reach the highest value in late 1929, before falling 74% at the end of 1932 and hovering around the value until 1939. A typical property bought in the beginning of 1920 would have retained only 41% of its initial value two decades later. And this was Manhattan. Consider that in the period from 1920s to 1950s, more than three decades, there was little recovery in price level. Think of this absolutely massive demand drivers present through those decades. Electrification and all it enabled, e.g. refrigeration appliances and all kinds of industrial machinery the automobile, and the associated build-out of the highway system and suburbanization. Telecommunications, telephone, radio, TV. Air travel. A global war, followed by the Korean War, and the Cold War arms race. And population growth. No such drivers of demand are present now. It's quite the opposite. Artificial intelligence, AI, and robotics are inherently deflationary. We are told that people are not needed. Perhaps that is a tad deflationary. The quote-unquote inflation we are now seeing is not due to strength in the global economy. The underlying intractable problem of our time is not inflation, but deflation. 
the quote-unquote inflation is illusionary. It is created by massive devaluation of money and artificial scarcity. Consider the implications of the Nord Stream sabotage. Good point. Perhaps you have heard of the everything bubble. What is it? I'll explain the horror of it simply. Let's take the example of a single bond with no fixed maturity date, i.e. a perpetuity. This bond pays a fixed annual dividend of $5. If the market rate of interest is 5%, this bond has value of $100. If the Fed lowers interest rates such that the market rate of interest for this bond is now 1%, what happens to the value of the perpetuity? The fixed dividend is $5 remains unchanged as 5 is 1% of 500. The value of the perpetuity goes up five-fold to $500. Now, if the Fed increases market rates back to 5%, the value of the perpetuity paying a fixed dividend of $5 returns to 100, and hence there is an 80% decline in value. It's basic math. The entire global financial complex is, essentially, a big perpetuity, i.e. a financial instrument with no fixed maturity date. Right. I want to make a point about this, too. It's not just the global financial complex that is essentially a big perpetuity and a, a financial institute with no fixed maturity date. What is a Federal Reserve note? A Federal Reserve note is a promise to pay. That's what it says right on it. It's a promissory note. It's a promise to pay. Okay. If nobody ever uses anything but Federal Reserve notes, is anybody actually ever paid no because nobody uses gold and silver so as it states in article 1 section 10 no state shall you know dada, yada 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 make anything but gold and silver a tender in payment of debt well then tomorrow never comes right it's a perpetuity that never happens oh uh, what am, what am i going to pay you tomorrow it's always tomorrow it's always in the future it's never finished. There's no finality to any of this system. And that's kind of the point of what he's getting at here. So the prices of all fixed income instruments are determined by interest rates. And all equity market and commercial real estate values are similarly driven. The Fed created the quote-unquote everything bubble with the justification of fighting the global financial crisis, which, of course, the Fed had also created by lowering the Fed fund rates from 5% to near zero and then keeping it near zero for almost the past 15 years. The Fed has now increased the Fed fund rate from near zero in April 2022 to more than 5% in just one year, which is psychotic, but anyway. That the decline in global financial and real estate markets will be massive has been made certain. This cake is baked. The financial gains of the past 15 years have been an illusion. Some take comfort in thinking that the losses can be hedged in the derivatives markets. If that is the case, the losses will not disappear. They are in the derivatives complex. Epic losses will be concentrated on the balance sheets of the CCPs, which, as we have seen, are designed to fail. So everything's going to come back to the banks anyway. This is their final push to take all of the collateral. Everything that's ever been pledged. That's their goal. Make no mistake about it. But to continue, some take comfort in saying that the Fed will lower rates again when they are forced to do so. Have you noticed that they are not lowering rates despite the first bank failures? This is just the beginning of such failures given the basic math explained above. The Fed is sharply increasing rates into economic weakness and a banking crisis. This is exactly what was done in the Great Depression. Make no mistake about that. There's plenty of history here. This is what they do every single time. Build it up, crash it, steal what they can. Build it up again, crash it, steal what they can. And how do they build it up every time? They build it up through instruments that are pure fiction. They're not based on any actual value. And then people buy them up, and then they crash it, and again and again and again. This is their modus operandi. They've done this for literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, if you want to consider like the whole crash of Rome as well. But that was more money deflation than anything else. That was the destruction of coins and a lot of other factors I don't want to get into. But still same idea. Still creating something, trying to create something out of nothing, you always end up with nothing. 
as was poetically stated in the Jerome Daly case, also known as the Credit River decision, wherein the judge said that only God can create something out of nothing. When in that case, they found that Federal Reserve notes were not lawful consideration and basically, in that case, also determined that any time that a Federal Reserve note is used, that it voids the contract because there's no lawful consideration given between the parties. And that's one of the things that has to make a contract valid. You can't have a contract where no lawful consideration is exchanged between the parties if you're actually asking the other party to do something or to buy something. Well, the debt is only ever discharged. Again, it goes back to the thing that, oh, it's always tomorrow, it's always tomorrow. Well, it, tomorrow never comes. It, it never actually gets paid. And it has no lawful consideration anyway because of what Nixon did when he dropped the gold standard. And, of course, that was always supposed to be, quote, unquote, temporary. Well, it's been permanent. So until we do away with this system, they're going to keep doing this over and over and over. There's no question about it. But to continue. And they are doing this with the bizarre and cruel justification of fighting wage growth. Uh huh. When the quote-unquote everything bubble is imploded, we will face a deflationary depression, which will span many years, even decades. This coming great deflation is intrinsic to the great taking. The architects of the great taking have planned and prepared to use this dynamic fully, secure in their knowledge that as night follows day, massive and prolonged deflation will certainly follow the epic debt expansion supercycle which they created. The architects have assured that they alone are positioned to take everything and that you and your children are positioned on the other side of that, i.e. to lose everything, to be enslaved and even destroyed by it. People will be knocked down and not be able to get up again. That is intentional as the populace has been systematically encouraged to go deeply into debt, whom the gods would destroy. They first cause us to borrow at low rates of interest. Exactly. And of course, the aspect of the debt thing, the systematically encouraged to go deeply into debt, this all started with credit cards, right? The banks had to figure out ways to make more and more of their fake money out of nothing. So what did they do? They allowed everybody to take out credit cards. First started with checks, in a sense, because when you put your signature to a check, you're creating a debt instrument. You're creating um, what they call an original issue discount. And you're creating the debt. You're creating the thing, the promise to pay, if you will, the promissory note. The same way that the Fed creates promissory notes called Federal Reserve notes, when that the Federal Reserve buys the bonds from the Fed, and then they say, we'll pay, we'll pay you back later. Well, that's what the Federal Reserve note is. It just says that this guy owes this guy so much money. But again, it never gets paid. So, to continue. As the Great Depression, prolonged deflation will assure that people who are in debt will not be able to make payments on their debts, let alone repay them. They will be trapped. All property and businesses financed with debt will be taken. With profound and persistent deflation assured to stretch over many years, debt becomes a powerful weapon of conquest. And to make a point on that, I believe Jefferson had a fairly good quote regarding debt, but I can't, I can't think of it right off the top of my head if anybody wants to find that particular one. It might have been Adams, though, too. It was one of the two of them, I think, that talked about... They talked about debt as a weapon to, I think, I think they said to enslave nations. It had something, the quote had something to do with debt and something to do with enslaving nations, and that it was more powerful than weapons to enslave nations. Well, here you go. So now the International Bank Cartel is going to enslave not a nation, but the entire planet by doing this. So debt is not a real thing. As I said, it's, a, it's basically a, a fictionary, fictional creation. It is an invention, a construct designed to take real things. It is instructive to look at the deeper meaning of the word debt. The root word is believed by etymologists to be an ancient Proto-Indo-European word. Now, just to stop for a second. Proto-Indo-European is the base language, pre-Latin, pre-all of the Romance languages, 
and it's the language that they believe was, and, and it even predates uh, Celtic Druidic. It's the language that they they believe was spoken mostly through Europe during kind of the end of the last ice age and probably stopped being spoken or at least possibly was lost during the the younger Dryas impact so just to give a little history about what proto indo-european word actually or where that what that even is okay so believed to be this word um gaba i'm kind of guessing at the pronunciation of that meaning to give to hold or to receive it is found in sanskrit Gabatsi, I'll take a stab at it like that. Okay, in Sanskrit, gabatsi, hand, forearm. The Latin, uh, heber, to have, to hold, possess. The Old English, gifan. The Old Norse, gifa, to give. And in the present day Swedish, ger, gives. However, the Latin prefix d, meaning to do the opposite or undo or to take away totally and completely, think of the word defrost. Utterly negates this giving, having, or holding. So it's the absolute opposite. D, E, B, and then B, T, bet, is the opposite of. So again, according to the Online Etymology Dictionary, which is, by the way, Etym Online is a great place to just go and look these things up. I've never looked at this one online at etym- etymological dictionary, but etym, just etym online. So E-T-Y-M online, I think it's .com, is one of the best places to go and look that up. And if anybody wants to pop that right now for the word debt, that'd be great. I'd be happy to read that as well since we're in this. Because I love getting in deep into etymology because we do really under need to understand where these words come from because that's how the attorney literally smacks us up on the side of the head every single time we wander into court or we enter into a contract and we don't understand what certain specific words mean. And they really, meaning the attorney, they really do it to us in any contract that the corporate state gives to us, right? So it's way worse that way. Okay, so Link hit it. Let me check. Let me pop this real quick and we can take a look at what Adam Online says regarding debt. Okay, debt. Dete, anything owed or due from one person to another, a liability or obligation to pay or render something to another. From Old French, dete, from Latin, debitium, thing owed, uh, neuter past participle of debere, probably, to own. Originally, keep something away from someone, from d away, which is what he just spoke of. So d is away from, away from haber to have. So D away from haber, so away from to have it, meaning a state of being under obligation to make payment is from mid 14th century restored spelling after 14th century mid Middle English debt of the body was quote that which spouses owe to each other debt of the body. Oh, that's interesting. That's fascinating. I never knew that. Okay. Uh, also meaning sexual intercourse. Okay. So they have indebted. And then the D, the aspect of the, the opposite of, or not to do, but the opposite undo. Okay, so they do have this one. Okay, they do go back that far. All right, great. So, gebe, and again, I'm probably butchering that. To give or receive, the basic sense of the root is, it probably is to hold, which can either be in offering or in taking. And then all forms are part of, all the rest of these other words are part of that. Okay, cool. So, Nice. Always good to check our etymology whenever possible. Because as I said, the attorney will use that against you every single time that they can. Okay, so to continue. The bottom line is that debt has for centuries had the function of depossessing or taking away property, capital, and investments from someone. We can plainly see in their deliberate preparations over decades to take on a vast scale that there will be no debt forgiveness. Ancient societies knew the practice of the debt jubilee, which is also something that was done, I believe, in Catholicism on a regular basis, i.e. a comprehensive forgiveness of debts. And this, and again, historically, this aspect of the ancient societies knew the practice of debt jubilee. Right. Well, who are the only ones that were able to perpetuate or loan money at interest? Because the Catholics outlawed it. It was the Jews. Everybody else in the Christian world said, nope, we're not doing that. Well, they kept doing it. So what did Christians end up doing? They ended up giving all these things to the Jews because 
they weren't going to enter into the practice, but they still went and got the debt. See, what should have happened is, is that Catholicism and all Christianity should have just outlawed, not just outlawed the practice of any Christian doing it, but should have said that no Christian should ever do it. But in a sense, it does, because, you know, I believe there's a passage in the Bible that says a borrower nor a lender be, right? So, and yes, exactly. Another thing, forgive us, forgive us our debts in the Lord's Prayer. Precisely. It's in there, too. So, Yeah. But to continue, ancient sites knew the practice of debt jubilee. This, I think, should happen again. Honestly, we should, as an American society, say, look, this is not a new thing. This has happened before hundreds and hundreds of times in the ancient world and seeing as how we're all sovereign. Do we owe them anything? No. Not a thing. Have they given us anything? No, not a thing. Particularly not to the Joan Daly case, right? So why not just have a debt jubilee? I think that would be the best way to go, right? So the debt jubilee was enacted repeatedly in the interest of general human welfare. Exactly. No debt forgiveness is intended now. But what purpose should the artificial constructs and institutions of society serve, if not human welfare? What must vitally concern each and all of us, if not human welfare? And what did it state in the Declaration of Independence? Yeah. The powers that be have designed an elaborate legal construct. Legal construct. Make a point right there. To prevent individual states from directing their central banks to create the money to protect the depositors. If many trillions can be created to bail out private banks, the same could certainly be done to bail out the depositors as a social imperative. That it will not be done is a sign of the true intent. Deprivation and subjugation. Right. Again, by who? The Khazarian mob. This quote-unquote great reset is anti-human. It is intended to fix in place a system something like feudalism in perpetuity, in which the populace is held in a state of deprivation and fear with the empty promise of safety. Wake up! We have been living within a protection racket, in which the protectors terrorize the protected. Those supposedly protecting us from the bad guys are the bad guys. And I'll make another point here about what he states. What did Benjamin Franklin say? Those who are willing to exchange what for what deserve neither. Anybody want to answer that? <laughs> and he's right. Right. Security for liberty is the answer. Right. So you, you can't go and ask somebody for your security because you will be giving up your liberty. Only you are the one that has the, the sole duty of your own security. There's nothing else. You as a sovereign have the duty for your own security and your own liberty. So if you're overly dependent on anything as a human being, you are by definition a slave. Now, some people would argue that, oh, well, this society works on so many different levels and you can't live without that and you can't live without this. Okay, stop. Could you live without refrigeration? Sure, you could. You could salt your meat and do a bunch of other things. You could have root cellars, which is, in a sense, a form of refrigeration. But the point is, would you need the mechanical part of it? No. You could, or we all could, go back to a late 1800 lifestyle and be all very quite happy. Would we have all these extra little perks and things? No. Could we live completely content? Yes, absolutely, without question. Would it take a bit of work and effort? Yeah, probably the kind of work and effort that millennials probably don't want to put in, or particularly woke ones. But that's fine. Those who will not take on the duty of their own self-reliance, their own self-defense, their own self-awareness, and self-governance if you're not having those four then some aspect of your sovereignty you are giving away to someone else and that by definition then makes you a slave and so what they've been doing and it's not just okay this great reset yes this is kind of like the end game that we're in now but they've been doing this ever since we broke away and said no we're not dealing with this you're not going to put us instantaneously into debt, which is what was going on in the colonies and which ben Benjamin Franklin clearly stated was the actual reason for the Revolutionary War. It had nothing to do with taxation without representation. That was something that the 
messed up school system and those that would want to have us forget placed into the idea that that was the reason. It wasn't the reason. The main reason for the Revolutionary War was that we were instantaneously in debt always to the Bank of England. We were not allowed to create our own free money system. It was all debt money, and we had to do it because we were still under the yoke, if you will, of the king. Well, we took care of that, fought a war, said bye, get out of here. Then we created constitutions that laid these things out that said, nope, we're not doing this anymore. And we create a declaration of independence saying that any time that any government starts doing these things, guess what? We get to throw that out too and start over. In fact, Jefferson said that every generation is owed their own revolution. And I tend to agree with him because you have to throw out all of the things that do not work from the past generation. No generation ever is bound to the stupidity of the generation before it. They don't have to go along with it. They're dead. Do the dead have the right to control the living? I mean, if you really think about it. Of course, the answer is no. So, we've been fighting this, and they've been trying to take it back ever since the Revolutionary War. By what? By this slow boiling of the frog. And I could get into all the different ways, but just to hit some main points would be the public school system, dumbing everybody down, the destruction of the common law, and trying to govern everybody by statutes. Because there's only two origins of law, common law and statute. That's it. And statutes are obviously always an aspect of Roman civil law, of controlling fictions and corporations, which is fine as long as that's all it's doing. But as, as, as soon as... Roman civil law starts to attempt to administer any free man doing anything, it's automatically tyranny. There's no debate about that. So all these fights have been going on for a very long period of time, and they have been winning because we won the Revolutionary War through force of arms. They are winning this war through force of insight because no one is bothering to wake the fuck up and understand what these things are. Not just all this banking of the aspect of what we're reading here in The Great Taking, but so much more regarding the law, which is clearly stated by Bastiat in The Law, which, by the way, is the book that I also give to everyone that is listening to this class. You can download and read The Law by Frederick Bastiat. A perfect companion, if you have never read it, to go along with this book. So, the link of which will be in the mega file in all the show notes in the class. So, just look for it. It'll be down there. So, conclusion. Chapter 10. Let every soul submit himself unto the authority of the higher powers. There is no power but God. The powers that be are ordained by God. Tyndale Bible, 1526. For his efforts in translating certain texts into English of the day, William Tyndale was jailed in a castle just outside of Brussels, and then executed by strangulation, after which his body was burned at the stake. Yeah. Perhaps one might, at some point, come to question whether the powers that be are ordained of God. One can easily know that they conduct wars against innocent people. Curtis LeMay famously said, There are no innocent civilians. It is their government, and you are fighting a people. You are not trying to fight an armed force anymore. So it doesn't bother me much to be killing the so-called innocent bystanders. As a human being, should this not concern you? What part of the organized slaughter of vast numbers of innocent people can you find acceptable? Do you believe that you are special in some way? That you were being protected or that you will be protected now? Right, good point. And to make a point about this whole aspect of war, you, everybody that's listening to this, is currently engaged in what is called low-intensity conflict. And 
anybody who's been in the military probably knows this term fairly well, as do anybody who's actually been trained in or has learned anything about psychological warfare. Low-intensity conflict is a warfare tactic. You don't believe me? You can go read a couple of different papers. One is the report from Iron Mountain, and the other one is, it escapes me at the moment, but low-intensity conflict is what they're doing to you. And it comes in every single form you could possibly fathom. It comes in advertisement. It comes in the changing of the law, this type of oppression through saying, oh, you have to do X, Y, Z because I say so. Well, wait, hold on. Wait a second. Don't I have unalienable rights? Not in this court, you don't. Oh, really? Then am I actually in a court? Oh, that's right. I'm not in a court. I'm in an administrative proceeding in front of a black robe priest of L who's actually not acting as a magistrate, but who's actually acting as a special administrator. And the court itself is a private for profit corporation listed on Dun and Bradstreet, who has a separate purse from the state, which, by the way, severs their 11th Amendment immunity, by the way, just in case anybody didn't know that. So you can sue any of these courts. They have no 11th Amendment immunity. So that's what you're sitting in front of. Is that low intensity conflict? You're better fucking believe it is. Every time you go into court, don't you feel like you're being terrorized? Absolutely. Every time that you see flashing lights behind you when you're traveling down the road, a road of which, by the way, you paid for every time that you went to the gas pump and pulled that trigger, you paid for your road. And does the road belong to the state? The answer is no. The center of the road comes to the middle of every single land patent that has ever been done. Your neighbor owns the road and the land that it sits on. You and your neighbor both paid for the road. But make no mistake, your neighbor is allowing you an easement on his land to get from point A to point B. And he doesn't tax or toll you, right? You don't have to stop every time you come into somebody else's property and, oh, wait, pay my toll. Oh, my, right? We don't do that to each other. So this is what they're doing. Low intensity conflict is on every single level you could possibly fathom. So when he talks about the war, and so it doesn't bother me so much killing the so-called innocent bystanders, this is so much bigger than you can possibly fathom. Okay? So I just wanted to make that point. All right, to continue. There has been abundant evidence of great evil at work in the world, throughout time and in our present time. Do you really wish to be ignorant of its existence and operation? There is an interconnectedness of all things. If you don't care about the obvious lies, the deaths of innocent children, the fire bombings of cities, the suppression of dissident, the propaganda, the escalating terrorism, in which, quite strangely, innocent people are always and everywhere the target. Sooner or later, it is coming for you or your children or your grandchildren. If you know and you're not doing anything about it or saying anything about it, it's time. And I would say that Learning the law, learning the destruction and manipulation of the law, particularly through the history of English jurisprudence between the, the and I'm going to call it what it is, the wars between the ecclesiasticists, which are those are the ones that wanted to have ecclesiastical law, the, the civilists, which are those that try to perpetuate Roman civil law, and the common law, and then to a certain extent also even the law merchant, which is your maritime amity law which they don't have a name for the people of that, but you get the point. So all these different jurisdictions of law came from different places. They were created by different groups of people or different people over time. And we adopted the English common law. But the difference between it, how the English common law works and how our, how our American jurisprudence works is that we're sovereign. We declare, we decree, we create what the law is in the foundational documents and say, this is what power we're vesting to you, only on good behavior. And if you step out of that box, we get to whack you over the head. Because we didn't vest you with any other power other than these things here. That's it. And to make that very clear, the arguments in the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers about the absolute requirement of a Bill of Rights are undeniable. They said, there's no way... We're going to allow this federal creature to be created because they were worried about centralized power, which 
of course, is what happened anyway. But they made sure that there was a Bill of Rights in there to make sure that, hey, da, 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 you're not exceeding your jurisdiction here. And by the way, if you do, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment are the bookends. Anything not delegated is what? To the state or what? We the people. Because we the people are the fountain of the law. It all stems and all flows from us because we are the sovereignty. Unlike England, where they have the king and the king says X, Y, Z, and that's the aspect of what the common law is. Okay, fine. But we said no to that. We're done with that. So we do it ourselves. Now, how do we continue to do it ourselves even after the constitutions are written? That's a grand jury. A grand jury is the fourth branch of government. It's not called that anymore, but that's what it is. Because in a grand jury, we can do anything we want to. We can strike down any law. We can indict any judge. In fact, that's the main reason why Nixon left. It's because he was being attacked by the grand jury. Because the grand jury was coming after him, that's why he left. He's like, no, 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 I'm out of here. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Because there is no limit, limitations of power when it comes to a grand jury. They can subpoena anything. I don't care who you are. Grand jury subpoena something, you don't give it to them. Guess what? You can go spend time in jail under contempt of the grand jury. Which is exactly what uh, Hale versus Henkel, that court case. Hale versus Henkel was a 19-something court case, early 1900s. And... Anyway, I'm not going to get into it. But just read the case. It's, it's very powerful as to the understanding of what our power is under the grand jury. And that's what we need to do. We need to start wielding our power again. Because we have been asleep at the wheel for so long that this is what we're now dealing with. Our enemies, and make no mistake about it, the Kazarian mob is your enemy. Okay? I don't care if you're white, black, or Asian. doesn't matter. They are your mortal enemy. And they want to enslave every single other race other than them. Why? Because they're Luciferian filth. That's what they do. So know that, know who your enemy is, and know the history of this. And by the way, as far as the history is concerned, as far as the law, if anybody wants to get a real full history of law, and I can only post this on Odyssey. So you go to Odyssey, go to playlists, and go to the, uh, go to the timeline, the VSOF timeline class, 4,000 years of history, the old world anew. This was a very long class and it took me all day to do. And there's a timeline of which I didn't even get through all of it. And I'm still updating, but this shows you the totality of all the history of it. In case you are just new to this, in case this is the first time you're learning this, or you, you really learn better by timelines, then make sure that you go watch that class go take your time, download the timeline and do yourself a favor, add things to it that I might've missed. And if you find anything that is really important that I might have missed, go ahead, join the Gilded server and give it to me. And I'll make sure that it goes into the timeline. Okay. So we can keep these things organized and so we know that they can't sneak away or change history on us, which is what they've been doing. And that, again, is part of the low intensity conflict. Okay. Back to it. It is time to start connecting the dots because they lead to you. If you are wealthy, you might assume that because the system has allowed them to accumulate wealth, they will be protected in some way, that they are special. You are special. They're saving you for dessert. You have been allowed to chase profits while the well-being and resilience of your people have been broadly and systematically eliminated. There are monsters under the stairs eating people alive. But you don't want to look under the stairs because you want to keep using the stairs. To not know is bad. To not want to know is worse. And I will add something else to this. None are more helplessly enslaved than those who falsely believe that they are free. That is a quote by Gotha. And I think it's very important that everybody know that. Because that's exactly what's happening. Willful ignorance of the existence and operation of evil is a luxury even the wealthy can no longer afford. We are in the grip of the greatest evil humanity has ever faced or refused to acknowledge, as the case may be. Hybrid war is unlimited, and this is exactly getting into the low-intensity conflict. That, that's hybrid war for you. That's what he's talking about here. It has no bounds. It is global, and it is inside your head. It is never-ending. 
and I'm going to read what Cap said here. Low intensity warfare is used essentially to break the spirits and keep the people tired and apathetic and nearly hopeless. It also keeps people's defenses down as they can get so used to things happening that they, they stop keeping their guard up. And that's true. And also when it comes to law, there's a maxim that states, he who slumbers on his rights has none. There's also another maxim of law that I believe I might butcher this a little bit, but it basically states that anything long agreed to cannot then therefore afterwards be, I think, adjudicated. And again, I might be butchering that one. But the point is, is that when you know something's wrong and you and you do not take action to fix it, to get rid of it, to say, nope, I'm not doing that, or to just stand up and state your will and say, no. If you keep agreeing to certain things, well, then they become the norm. And that's what the Kazarian mob has done. It's what the attorney has done. And as he says, it is never ending. Oh, thank you, John, for posting Hale versus Hinkle. If anybody has not seen that case, 1906 case, it's in chat. Read it. And read it right off of Justinia because they have their link. I've read that one off of Justia. Justia. It's, it's a good read. Tells you everything about the case. Read it because it's the power of the grand jury. Okay. So, okay. To continue, nothing focuses the mind like an imminent hanging or as Samuel Johnson originally said, quote, depend upon it, sir. When a man knows he is to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. It's a horrible thing to think about, but yeah, I'm sure he's probably right. Hybrid war can be stopped. Stopping it begins in your mind. And this is the other thing about the aspect of the mind. This is why, obviously, guys like Alex Jones say this is an info war, and it is. Tammy used to tell me, you think the law says this. It doesn't say that. What they're doing is they're running an easement through your mind to make you think that it applies to you. And as long as you allow them to run easements through your mind, that they're walking back and forth all day long through your mind, you are enslaved to them. Your, your mind is enslaved to them. You have to wake up and say, no, that's not true. Or no, I don't care what you say. I'm not doing this. And know that you have unleanable rights. Because again, you have rights and they're inherent within you. You can't give a right away. You can vest a power away, but you can't give a right away. They're inherent within you. They're part of you. They're like your dreams. They're what make you you. But. If you don't exercise a right, do you really have it? The answer is no. So to continue. During the Great War, Edward L. Bernays had worked with the Committee on Public Information to, quote unquote, sell the war to the public. By the way, Edward L. Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. In 1928, he published his book, Propaganda, another book everybody should read, in which we can read this statement on the subject. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Right. I think he was talking about his buddies, the Kazarian mob. Better believe it. And make a side note on that. When George Soros, not all that long ago, said, you don't know what they're capable of. But he didn't say who they were. That's who he was talking about. He's talking about the Kazarian mob, the totality of the world banking cartel. And the head of which, of course, is the Rothschild family. To continue, the systematic psychological manipulation of society begun with the evils of the Great War has continued nonstop and has escalated to the point that we are now subject to full-spectrum, continuous psychological operations. Exactly. 81 years after the publication of Bernays' book, Chris Hedges wrote the following. A public can no longer distinguish between truth and fiction, is left to interpret reality through illusion. Random facts or obscure bits of data and trivia are used either to bolster illusion and give it credibility or discarded if they interfere with the message. When opinions cannot be distinguished from facts, when there is no universal standard to determine truth in law, in science, in scholarship, or in reporting the events of the day, when the most valued skill is the ability to entertain, the world becomes a place where lies become true where people can believe what they want to believe. This is the real danger of pseudo-events, and pseudo-events are far more pernicious than stereotypes. They do not explain reality, as stereotypes attempt to, 
but replace reality. Pseudo events redefine reality by the parameters set by their creators. These creators who make massive profits selling illusions have a vested interest in maintaining the power structure they control. And what are those power structures? Every single type of media and even literacy, even literacy, because if a systematic system of critical thinking is not implemented, even literacy itself becomes a form of mind control because you could read a book, but maybe you don't know why this guy wrote the book. Maybe you don't know that he had an agenda. Maybe you're just reading and you just start to believe everything that this guy's saying. Well, wait a second. Don't you have something called critical thinking? And if you don't have critical thinking, you have to realize why you don't have it. And critical thinking is the aspect of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. It's called the trivium. And everybody better learn that real quick. Because you cannot learn the law without it. You cannot discern what they've been doing for thousands of years without it. And you're going to be subject to exactly what Chris has just said in those few paragraphs. They have a vested interest in maintaining the power structures they control. Right. Because their power structures are information. To make you believe. To keep those easements within your mind. But to continue. The people behind the wars have never been investigated and removed from power. They have continued in control of all central banks and money creation and have extended their control globally. Right. I highly suggest everybody go watch All Wars or Bankers Wars, which you can find on the VSOF YouTube channel and Odyssey. Certainly, many who have abated to this ignorance of the greater design, but the people behind the wars are quite literally lying, thieving killers, and they know it. To say that there is much evidence of this is an understatement. Perhaps they have not killed innocent men, women, and children with their own hands, but they have deliberately caused these deaths. That is done with intent, can be known through the persistence of their planning and actions over many decades. While the scale and audacity of this criminality seems unimaginable to us, nothing is unimaginable to them. Their criminality has now reached unprecedented and ultimate scale as its aim is the subjugation of the entire globe and of all people. Make no mistake about that. That is what we are facing, my fellow sovereigns. Wars have always been not so much about taking things as about subjugation of populations on all sides. Vast destruction and death are acceptable to their planners. You might ask, how could the people plotting and executing such insane schemes be held together? I suggested it as something to do with the binding power of shared guilt of the criminal pact. I personally would also add that it has to do with the continuation of not recognizing actual biological psychopathy. And if anybody wants to go watch a, a free documentary on this, about psychopathy, go watch the, the documentary called Fish Head. Very good documentary about psychopathy, about what a psychopath is, about how they operate, and that, and Mark Passio also talks about this as well, about the, the possible percentage of the human population that could possibly be biological psychopaths. Now, to make a point here, what am I talking about? Okay, a biological psychopath does not have the capacity for feeling. They do not have the capacity for empathy. They have to, at a very young age, realize that they are different. And what they get very, very good at is mimicking or pretending to have empathy or feelings. But they don't. They don't have any. It, it, it literally does not exist. It's like as Mark Passio says, it's like trying to ask a man who doesn't have hands to start typing on a computer. It can't be done. You literally cannot change these people. Now, I don't want to get into a debate about what should be done with them. Uh, whatever. That, you, your mind can go wherever you want to with that. But when it comes to actual crimes against humanity, should they be tried? Should they be indicted and executed? Absolutely. Without question. I mean, even first-time offense under the common law for thievery is death. 
but you know, why do you think they hate the common law so much? Right. Cause it'll be dead. So I just wanted to bring those couple things up because that, that understanding about how crazy they are, it usually goes right over people's heads. Like they don't really understand like how this could possibly happen. Well, it's because of biological psychopathy. And then, so biological psych psychopaths then create what Mark calls secondary psychopaths, which are the ones that learn how to be psychopathic, but that's a choice with them. With the biological psychopaths, they have no choice. They are absolutely batshit crazy and they will kill you for a dollar. doesn't matter. They wouldn't feel anything about it. Absolutely irrelevant. They actually think it's fun. So to continue, the perpetuators are each and all are bound, whether explicitly or unconsciously by evidence of shameful treasonous acts committed against their own people. The commission of crime is a power totem among them, right? Like how many things did you do today? The more heinous the crime, the more powerful is the binding force. This is where you get into the, all of the aspects of adrenochrome and human trafficking and child trafficking, human sacrifice, which is something that these people have been doing for thousands upon thousands of years. I could get into the whole history of the Kazarian mob, but I don't really need to. If anybody really wants to check that out, all you really have to do is go read the Veterans Today article on hidden history of the incredibly evil Kazarian mafia. And I will repost this again in chat. Uh, most of you have already read this, but those of you that might have never heard or have no idea what I'm even talking about regarding what the Kazarian Mafia is, go read that article. And there's multiple different parts of the article, too. When you get to the bottom, make sure that you continue on to the next and, and say continue reading. Okay, there's multiple different pages for this. And it was written by Preston James, who's a PhD, and he did a fantastic job of explaining who these people are, where they come from, and and that they are not under any circumstances Semitic. So you can never be accused of being an anti-Semite because these people aren't Semitic. Never have been. Okay, so do continue. In the past few years, you have been living with an escalating hybrid war. Globally, we have witnessed overt media control and propaganda campaigns, censorship, including arrests of people speaking in public, monitoring of all electronic communications, and physical contact tracing. Brutally enforced lockdown and masking requirements, with people being beaten, handcuffed, and arrested even in their homes, suspension of healthcare services and weakening of healthcare systems, invasive testing requirements for employment and travel, forced quarantine of travelers, and coerced quarantine and quote-unquote vaccination of the healthy general population. Governments dropped all pretense of democracy and, Repu and Republican form of government, by the way, because that's what we are, and were emboldened to practice open despotism. There were no functioning checks on this power. The courts provided no effective recourse to the public. Well, right, because they're not going to, because the courts are part of the problem. All the courts are controlled by the Kazarian mob. The, only, the thing that they don't control is what? Grand jury. Okay, just remember that. Governments broadly abuse fundamental human rights using, as justification, the need to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, which are, in truth, a great many ever-present and continually evolving. And so this justification, if allowed to stand, affirms the end of democracy and Republican form of government and the continuation of openly despotic government. Are you able to contemplate that this may have been about more than a virus? We have witnessed designs and real attempts to exert physical control over every person's body globally. And this is continuing. Why is this happening? I will make a startling assertion. This is not because the power to control is increasing. It is because this power is indeed collapsing. The quote unquote control system has entered collapse. I have to agree with him. The crazier and crazier that these psychopaths get it means that their system is closer and closer to ending. Now they think they're going to wander out the other side and be all powerful and whatever. That's never going to happen. Because if you're going to try and do this to the whole entire human race, the whole entire human race is going to stand up and say, yep, that's enough of you. And trust me, when the hunting starts, it's not going to end well. And it's probably going to take a whole lot of innocent life with it, unfortunately. But the rage that has built up across this entire planet 
for yeah past several thousand years is going to explode i have no doubt about that now hopefully we in america can do what we need to do to have a controlled restart of our republic by learning the law learning our power and wielding it properly that's the only way we're going to get out of this in any way shape or form that on the other side it's going to resemble something that we still want to live in and if we don't well then it's going to resemble chaos and probably something we don't want to live in so learning your civics learning the law learning your power as a sovereign and learning the four quadrants of sovereignty is the only thing that's going to get you through this. That and having your fellow man next to you that also knows this because no man is an island. So to continue, their power has been based on deception. Their two great powers of deception, money and media have been extremely energy efficient means of control. But these powers are now in rampant collapse. This is why they have moved urgently to institute physical control measures. However, physical control is difficult, dangerous, and energy intensive. Right. Keeping physical slaves is extremely difficult. Why? Because they know they're slaves. Why? Because you're restricting their actual physical movement. Right? That doesn't last too long. And so, they are risking all. They are risking being seen. Is this not a sign of desperation? And yes, obviously it is. Where will they hide when they have all the assets, when they have damaged all of humanity and caused billions to awaken through suffering? It's a good question. They promote the belief that they are all powerful. They are not. All they have had is the power to print money. The rest they have usurped from humanity. Never before has a system benefited so few at the great expense of so many. This is not inherently unstable and unsustainable. Right. Physical control, as opposed to rule by deception, requires enormous energy. This can be sustained while destroying all economies and abusing all people globally? I don't think so. They do not know how to, quote-unquote, build back better. Look at their footprint around the world, the destruction, the economic devastation. When it comes to the real world, they are exponentially good at just one thing, fucking things up. Then they declare victory and fix blame on others for the horrific damage done. Right. Just get out that chicken and cut its head off, right? We were told by Hobbes that war is the natural state of man. Hobbes' patrons were nobles. But is war natural? And inevitable? How did humanity survive? Think about it. Did humans survive by killing each other? It's oxymoronic. War is abhorrent. 100% of human survival is based upon cooperation. You cannot survive alone. You depend on everyone else and everything else. That is sanity. That is reality. And I would also add that that is Taoism. All organizations promoting war are criminal organizations. Period. Thank you. The people behind them are mass murderers. The men and women orchestrating chaos in country after country are criminals of the worst kind. The people following orders are not heroes. They are criminals. You want to watch a really, really good talk about that. About Go watch Mark Passio's lecture about order followers. Just It's well worth your time. The people controlling this system are quite obviously not benevolent. They are not noble. They are not elite. They are insane. They are the antithesis of everything we could value, admire, and love. These people do not represent human development or the future of humanity. They are lacking in essential human qualities. They are abhorrent. Antipathy for humanity is abhorrent. For 99.9% .9 of human history, psychopaths like these would not have survived the next winter. Right, because, okay, you want to go back far enough, to go back to the aspect of tribalism. If anybody showed this aspect of biological psychopathy, they were ostracized. 
you can't stay with the tribe. We don't care where the fuck you go, but go. Be gone. And they would have to kind of move from tribe to tribe, and then probably, most, most likely, someone finally had enough of their shit and killed them. Because it's, it, it would have been impossible to live back then on your own, right? You're not going to go you know, hunt down a, a woolly rhinoceros by yourself. Not happening, right? Or a mammoth. Not happening. So we kept a pretty good lock on it for a while. Now, is it just a random, I don't know, mutation of DNA? I don't know. I, I have not studied the aspects of biological psychopathy to the point to have a clear understanding of how it could permanently be fixed. I don't know if it can be, but this was the way that we fixed it before. So I don't have a problem fixing it in the same way now, but to continue their nature was seen and they were ostracized from the village to save the village. Precisely. They operate today through anonymity enabled by inhuman scale of social organization. Even so this will not allow them to continue indefinitely. We have entered a time in which their nature is being recognized. Knowledge of their existence has become unavoidable. Their grasping will come to an end because all of humanity cannot allow it to continue. Once it is recognized, humans will bond against a common existential threat. People from all walks of life will join in common cause. We have witnessed this already. The power structure can and must be dismantled. Nonviolently, the master well to a point you can die by grand jury try hang is that nonviolent? yeah it's certainly lawful but i under no circumstances am some sort of quaker i'm a taoist but that doesn't mean even though my name is zen it doesn't mean i'm a strict buddhist i am not some sort of pacifist. I, I'm a Taoist, and so I believe in the balance of nature and that natural law must prevail at all times. So something steals or attempts to steal from me, see it all the time in nature. You really want to go take that gazelle away from that lion? Good luck with that, right? The problem is we're not being lions and not realizing that we have the right to be. Our inherent right to kill anybody who tries to steal something from us is no different than that lion. Not at all. Not any higher or lower either. Just a different form of life. Believe me, that lion knows that you shouldn't be taking that from him or her. So do we. It's time to start acting on it. Start getting their claws back. Start saying, enough of that. Try and take this? Yeah, I'm going to bite you. And you have the right of lawful self-defense, which is also clearly laid out, again, in the law by Bastiat. So make sure you read that. All right, to continue. Their power structure can and must be demantled nonviolently. Okay, fine. Under his opinion. The quote-unquote masterminds will not yet be known. Well, we already know who they are. If you're at our level of knowledge, the students the VSOF. However, the individuals and organizations near the lever, levers of power, monetary, media, government, healthcare, military, police, legal, corporate, operating with criminal intent towards the mass of humanity can be identified. Right. Those are all the middle managers they'll go to. The allegiances of these functionaries are unstable, driven by narrow self-interest. By direct and personally putting these people on notice that their actions are being documented and subject to criminal prosecution, they may be imp- held to decline further involvement. This process can be accelerated. It is not necessary to wake up the majority. We are not fighting the 1%, but the 0.01%. Even without mobilizing the majority, it is entirely possible to realize an enormous advantage of intelligent, capable, activated people. Right. Another good reason to get your local militia up and running. If the people behind this great taking persist in their insane schemes, they will inevitably be found. It will be quite simple to follow the collateral to those who have arranged to take it. Perhaps they aren't such masterminds after all. We will come to know who is behind this hybrid war against humanity. 
We will come to know who controls the Bank for International Settlements, the Federal Reserve System, and all central banks globally, and hence all political parties, governments, media, and armed forces. But I just told everybody who it is. Go read the Veterans Today article. We will come to know who controls the CIA. Again, same people. And we will finally know who has been behind the assassinations. Let me close with JFK's own words. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. This has been the reading of The Great Taking, the book by David Rogers Webb. And you can find the playlists on Odyssey and on YouTube and Rumble, hopefully, sometime soon, will allow us to create playlists, but not quite yet. But what I did put up for everybody on Rumble is the documentary. Here it is. The documentary film, The Great Taking, featuring David Webb. So this is an hour and 11 minutes. I highly suggest that everybody watch that. It's a good addition to this reading. And I will come back and just check chat real quick. Uh, Amory said, inevitably, the pendulum will swing the other way but it's up to us to push it as far as we can. Yes, and I would say push it as fast as we can. They really have created a planetary human farm out of all the nations of the earth through money, debt, magic, and a greater understanding of all forms of law that we possess, indeed. But my understanding and direct experience is that the true orchestrators of this enslavement are not what we know as human. And I'd agree with that. I, I don't consider biological psychopaths to be human. I also don't consider anyone who has willfully made a pact with an evil entity, no matter what that is, whether it be other dimensional, whether it be uh, just a God that is evil that you believe in, whatever, or even if you even made a pact to other evil people here, all of those I throw right out of humanity. They're, they're not human. They're subhuman. And the servants of evil are all the slaves of the fallen ones. Right. So I totally agree with that. Oh, and thank you for the maxim, by the way. That maxim I was trying to remember was no injury is done by things long acquiesced in. Yes, that's the one I was trying to remember. Thank you very much for finding that. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming and participating tonight. Thank you, everybody, for putting up what you did to add to the discussion. And this has been the reading of The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb. And this has been the Vocational Science Freedom Saturday Night Civics and Sovereignty class. I hope all of you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And as always, stay safe and stay sovereign.